hear from Haley for some valuable insights today. And I hope we'll get a lot of um, things to take on from here on. Over to you, Haley. Excellent. Thank you so much for that intro. Um, so legislation is my favourite topic. So if you don't like legislation, I'm going to do my very, very best to not bore you senseless tonight. I know it's probably dinner time for a lot of people. My husband's cooked a roast, so I'm sitting here going, oh, I'm so hungry. Um, but we are going to run through. If you have questions as we go, pop them into the chat or into the Q&A. We will have time at the end to answer them. I will also send a heap of information through to Stevie after this session. So if you do want a copy of this presentation, um, I will send the PowerPoint presentation to her and she can share it with um, whoever would like a copy. So you'll definitely be able to uh, refer back to it later if you need to. I'm going to bombard you with a heap of information tonight and I talk really fast. So I do get overly excited about it. Um, so as we go, write your questions in and we'll definitely come to them towards the end. So the full um, suite of reforms were put in place on the 29th of March 2021. And the reason that date is significant, because it's the day after the moratorium for evictions ended. So we didn't go, you know, out of the COVID legislation into the old legislation, then into the new legislation. It was like just bang, we're straight into the new legislation. It was a bit of a rush. Um, we didn't get given a lot of the information enough in advance. Although we knew it was coming, they actually didn't even give us the legislation that we have to work under until the day before Easter. So, you know, we had to comply with it from the 29th of March, but they actually didn't give us a copy of it till the week after it came into play. So it was very interesting. Consumer Affairs is overseeing the implementation of the changes and they are doing consultations on all of this as well. Their website is really, really good. So if there's anything that you want to get information on, I've left a link into this slide here. Um, go visit the CAV website. I get lost in a wormhole. So I, I click on it and then I'm, I'm off and I'm there for hours just following links and reading all of the information. But there's really clear information on there now. So the changes were made back in 2014 and 15 with what was called the Fairer Safer Housing Review. And what they did at that point in time is they opened it up for public comment. And they said, who wants to see what in the, in the legislation? During that time, more than 4,800 people put in a public comment about what they wanted to see changed. And from that, um, there were 130 forms created. So. If you want to have a little look at the, um, uh, guess a, hold on, let me just, it's not. Sorry, yeah, I was just about to pop in there, Hayley. Yeah, that's all right. Did <laughs> it just disappear that minute? Thank you. All right, let me just go back to it. I shouldn't have done that. See, this is why you test everything. Everything works perfectly. There we go, much better. Better, all righty. <laughs> Um, so from that, the 132 for reforms were created, and that's a really good link there. So I know it says all changes are in place from July 2020, but they didn't obviously come into place on that date. They just haven't updated their link. But that information gives you a summary of what the 132 reforms are that Consumer Affairs Victoria has created. And out of that, they've also included resources for practitioners, and they're really good. So there's always been these, I guess, grey areas where we as property managers interpret legislation in a certain way. Our clients, whether it be our renters or our landlords, interpret legislation in a certain way. And then we go to VCAT and they interpret it uh, very differently than everyone else. So we never kind of know in certain circumstances how we are going to get a resolution for a client because the goalposts do move depending on if you go to VCAT and what the VCAT member decides. So what they've created is guidelines and fact sheets around those common areas that cause the most, I guess, angst and stress in the industry for our landlords, tenants and property managers. And these guidelines have to be used by VCAT. So one of the positives, black and white, not as much grey in the future. And it covers things like cleanliness, maintenance, urgent repairs, endangerment, what is fair wear and tear, what is damage in a property, plus a whole lot of other guidelines as well. 
And these are the things that I will email through to Stevie and she can forward them off to all of you if you want to have a read. And I do recommend you do have a read of these documents. So the regulations. The regulations form part of what we do. So the Re Residential Tenancies Act is about 835 pages now. It used to be 500, it's increased. Uh, the Residential Tenancies Regulations is about a 200 page document and you can download a copy of it there. Just like the legislation, they opened it up for public comment back in 2019. They gave us a copy of the draft regulations and what they called a regulatory impact statement. And we were able to look at all of that and, and say, this is what we wanna see changed under residential tenancies. At that point in time, 700 people put in a submission. I put in submissions at every opportunity. So I, um, I, I wanted to get my voice heard. So every opportunity I had to, you know, read the documentation we're provided with and then give back my own commentary, I did. Um, the regulations affect obviously rental providers, landlords, and about 1.5 million Victorians living in rental housing. Because not only does this include you guys as private housing operators, it includes public social housing, rooming houses, caravan parks, residential parks. So new terms, tenant, renter. I'm getting better at that one. Landlord, residential, rental provider, RRP or rental provider. So we have to stop saying landlord or owner. Um, I'm really struggling with that one. Lease, residential rental agreement or rental agreement, and agent stays as agent. So I don't put this slide in to scare you. I put this slide in to educate you. And the reason for that is penalty, penalty units. So penalty units are fines which can be imposed if you do the wrong thing under residential tenancies. One penalty unit is $165.22. It increases by 2.5% on the 1st of July each year, except for last year, nothing increased, including penalty units. So one of the biggest changes in the Residential Tenancies Amendment Bill and the Act, which has come out, is a significant increase in the multiple of the penalty units which can be imposed. So an example of this, it's a landlord duty to ensure that the day a renter moves into a property, a property has to be reasonably clean and vacant. Now that has been in the legislation forever. It used to have zero penalty units. It's gone up to 60 penalty units. So if we sign a tenancy agreement with a renter and, it, and they agree that they're moving into the property on the 25th of April, and on the 25th of April, we have to cancel that agreement because either the property is not vacant or not reasonably clean. And that renter takes you to VCAT for a breach of your obligation. And VCAT can then uh, fine you the penalty units of 60, so $10,000 fine. So when the team say to you, we need to leave enough wiggle room in between tenancies to ensure that we have the property vacant, reasonably clean, there's a reason. It's not just the agent trying to, you know, prolong the process or anything like that. They're trying to keep you compliant and safe. And depending on the property will depend on how much wiggle room we need. So pets. There's a lot of landlords that are angry about this one, but it's been in since the 2nd of March 2020. So if a renter does want to keep a pet, they have to complete a pet request form, which is a form approved by Director of CAV. They have to do it for each animal they want to keep. If they want three chickens, three forms. If you want to say no to the three chickens, three applications to VCAT to say no. You only have 14 days to act. If you don't act within 14 days by applying to VCAT to say no, it is automatic consent to keep the pet. Um, if you go to VCAT and VCAT actually awards you an order and says, I agree, the pet should be excluded from the property, it's not suitable. The renter then has 14 days from the date of the order to remove the pet. If they don't, it's a 28 day notice to vacate. So there's a very strict process. Now, I did a session today and I got told that there are eight hearings now that have been to VCAT in the last 12 months. Out of those eight hearings, only one owner has been successful at saying no to the pet. And that was because the pet was unsuitable for the property. 
So just be aware it is very difficult. There's been a lot of things tested throughout the last 12 months with pets. If you have a renter that applies for a pet or with a pet and they are suitable for the property, I recommend approving them because you are better off approving a suitable pet on application than having a renter apply for a property saying they have no pet and then all of a sudden they have two Alaskan Malamutes that they want to put in the house and then you've got to go down the VCAT path to say no. So just consider pets, you really can't say no. The legislation actually gives us more, I guess, control over pets than what we had in the past because in the past it was a silent legislation which meant if a renter got a pet, even if you didn't know about it and then you found out, Unless that pet, pet was causing damage or a nuisance, there's nothing you could have done about it. At least this way, we have ammunition. Number one, they have to be honest about the pet. And number two, we have ammunition that if we get an order saying no pets, the pet has to be removed and we can cancel the tenancy. We can't take a higher bond for a pet unless your rent is over $900 a week. You also just have to make sure that you've got the right insurance policy that gives you the maximum amount of coverage for pet damage. So applications and determinations, so inappropriate questions we can't ask on application forms anymore, such as has the renter had previous claims on their bond or have they had legal action taken? We also cannot ask for a state statement from a credit or bank account which shows daily transactions. We can ask for proof of bank balance, which is you know just a screenshot, uh, but we can't ask for that daily transactions. We also have to include our discrimination statement with all of our rental application forms now. And rental providers must not unlawfully discriminate or instruct their agent to unlawfully discriminate. So just make sure that if you uh, don't want to approve a tenant, all you have to say to the team is, I'm not going to approve this tenant. You don't have to go into a reason why. We don't need to know and we don't want to, or agents don't want to play in that discrimination sector. So if you're into your property since the 29th of March this year, um, you would have had to fill out a disclosure statement. Now, this is a disclosure statement that a residential rental provider has to complete and that information has to be given to the renter prior to them signing the lease. So, if an agent has been engaged to sell the property or if a contract of sale has been prepared and there's an ongoing proposal to sell the property. So, that's right at the start of the tenancy. You might say, yeah, we'll pop a tenant in. We're also going to pop it on the sale market and see if we can sell it. There's an action underway to enforce the mortgage over the property, which means that the mortgagee is taking possession. If you're not the owner of the property, but you've got a re legal right to let it, such as you know Airbnb, or it could be power of attorney. If the electricity is embedded electricity network, if a premises or common property is known by the owner to have been the location of a homicide in the last five years, if a property complies with rental minimum standards, now I'm just going to sort of park that one to the side for the moment. We will go through that shortly. Um, minimum standards, there's 14 that properties have to adhere to. If a rental provider has received a repair notice in the last three years related to mould or damp caused by or related to the building structure, and it starts on December 31 this year. The date of the most recent gas safety check, electrical safety check and pool barrier uh, safety check and that is something that um, Jamie is going to chat about later. If there's any outstanding recommendations to be completed from a gas or electrical safety check, if a premises is heritage listed, if the premises is known by the owner to be contaminated because the premises has been used for trafficking or cultivation of a drug of dependence in the last five years, if it's got asbestos, but only based on inspection by a suitably qualified person. And at the moment, there is no requirement that we have to get a suitably qualified person to inspect. It wouldn't surprise me if that one came in in the future, because I know in WA that is a requirement. Um, and I think in New South Wales, that's coming in in the future as well. If it's affected by building or planning application, 
if a premises or common property is known to be the subject of any notice, order, declaration, report, recommendation, things like, you know, combustible cladding or building defects or safety concerns. If there's a current domestic building work dispute, if there's a current dispute under part 10, the owner's corporation, and if there are owner's corporation rules, we do need to provide that to our renters. So just be aware that this is a new requirement. You, to the best of your knowledge, have to sign off on it to say that your property complies with these areas. So advertising a property and rent, you can only advertise properties at a fixed price. You can't say, hey, it's 300 bucks a week for the house, but I'll charge you $50 a week for the garage. Um, you also can't take offers of rent or you can't entice offers of rent higher than the advertised price. You can absolutely accept a higher unprompted offer made by a potential renter. If we do break that section, it's a potential of a 60 penalty unit fine. So residential rental agreements, there's certain prohibited terms now. There's a new prescribed form and it's called a form one and that's for a normal lease of up to five years. And we have a form two, which is a long-term five year fixed term period. Couple of things to consider. Number one, we have to use the prescribed form. We can put a couple of our own amendments in the lease, but the first 30 sections of that residential rental agreement cannot be changed. And I've had a lot of owners and property managers come to me and say, hey, I wanna change this lease. I'm like, you actually can't. It is prescribed. You have to do it word for word. If a renter has signed the rental agreement, but an owner has not, and the rental provider or agent has accepted rent or allowed part performance of the agreement, the agreement is enforceable. So what that means is Stevie and the team send a lease out to a renter and the renter signs it, it is a lease, regardless of whether you've signed it or not. Now, we got a win with professional cleaning and I am surprised that it came through as well as it did. I wasn't expecting it. What it basically means is, if a property is professionally cleaned immediately before the start of the tenancy, and evidence of this is provided to the renter at the start of the tenancy, then we can request that the renter returns the property professionally cleaned at the end of the tenancy. So again, massive win. That's not something we've ever been able to have in the past. Um, I'm really keen to see it tested at BCAP, but we do have a really uh, clear and uh, detailed guideline from Consumer Affairs, I think it's an eight or nine page document about what is cleanliness and what is reasonably clean. And that word immediately means the property has to be cleaned as close as possible to the start of the tenancy. If you had the property cleaned months or even years before the start of a tenancy, that's too far. You can't then turn around and say a renter has to do it. So it's got to be probably in there, you know, the two or three weeks, maybe up to four weeks, close to the start of that tenancy in order for it to be enforceable. So keys, let's pretend you own a three bedroom house and we sign up three renters for your property. So three of them sign the tenancy agreement, you must give a free set of keys to each renter. Now you don't have to give them all three window lock keys and three, you know, random keys for things that they're not going to need access to. It's access and enjoy. It's your access doors, doors that you have to provide. You can only charge a reasonable fee for additional or replacement keys and all keys and devices get returned at the end of tenancy. So deadlocks, they'll need to be fitted to every external door if there's not another security barrier preventing access. And a deadlock is a dead latch with at least one cylinder. So with a deadlock, I'm not a locksmith. So we are still waiting for the minimum standards to come through from consumer affairs on this. In my opinion, if you had a timber door and it just had a handle lock, not a deadlock on that front door, you would have to put a deadlock on. However, if you had a timber door and then you had a screen door in front of it and the screen door had a lock and a key, you wouldn't have to put a deadlock on that main door because they can't get through the screen door 
to get to the main door. So you've got those two barriers. Same with if you had an apartment on the third level, they have to get through the owner's corporation at the bottom, you wouldn't have to put a deadlock on your apartment door. So I am waiting for a bit more information from government on that one, but that's, I wouldn't go out and, you know, say that you've got to replace all of them immediately. Um, but you will need to just start considering that certain properties will have to have their deadlocks updated. So rental payments, um, we have to provide a reasonably available fee-free method of payments such as BPAY or electronic. We have to disclose any cost to a renter prior to them signing the agreement. We have to accept centre pay. Now we've got quite a few tenants on centre pay and they're brilliant. The rent gets paid regularly on time. We get it every two weeks. We never have to change a case there is. Um, it's good, it's a good process. So never get frightened of accepting centre pay tenants or centre pay payments, particularly during COVID, they were our strongest payers. We can only accept four weeks rent in advance. And if we do uh, serve a notice of rent increase, we can do them every 12 months. Um, and we, if we had a two year lease, we can do it at the 12 month mark, we still need to serve a notice of rent increase. If we break any of those sections, 60 50 units. Late rents. All right, there are three parts of the legislation that I'm unhappy about. This is one of them, right? So it's not all roses, I can tell you. But saying that, there is a lot, oh, there's not a lot of renters that will ever play this game or get to this level. Um, so I think we kind of worry it and we kind of put everyone in the same boat and go, no, it's going to be a disaster. But when you look at it, you might have one in a thousand that ever gets to this. Or I, I honestly can't think of anyone in our portfolio who would have played a game like this. I think in my 22 year career, I've probably had one or maybe two renters that would have played this game. So there is a new procedure now though, and it does give them more flexibility to pay their rent late. So. We get a strike system now, and basically the renter is allowed to have five strikes every 12 months. And it starts from the first day they move in for a 12 month period, resets, they get a clean bill of health, back to the strikes again in year two. So if a renter is more than 14 days late with rent, on the 15th day we issue a notice to vacate. When the renter pays back the overdue rent within 14 days plus postage, any notice to vacate by the owner for that overdue rent is invalidated. It applies for the first four times it happens in a 12 month period. However, if a renter fails to pay rent as required on a fifth occasion in the same 12 month period, the rental provider may give a notice to vacate and still apply to VCAT for a possession order. If it happens, VCAT may adjourn the possession application and put the renter on a payment plan they may adjourn the hearing and send the renter to financial counselling to see if they can adhere to a payment plan. Uh, they may give you possession. So there's different options they can do. A rental provider can apply to VCAT for compensation if the renter is more than 14 days late on two previous occasions and you've served those notices, the so two strikes. On the third occasion, when they're one day late, you can apply to VCAP for compensation. And what that means is your renter then gets summoned, well not summoned, but requested to go to VCAP for a hearing. So it can kind of scare them into compliance a little bit. So just remember, it's not great, but I don't think there's going to be a lot of people who will actually ever do this. And if they do, at least now we know the process, it's very clear cut and we can follow it and make sure that we do it correctly. So bonds, unless your rent is over 900 a week, you cannot take a higher bond, you can't demand or accept, which means that even if they offer it, you can't accept it. So previously this was for rents of over 350 a week. We can no longer take higher bonds for the principal place of residence either. Additional bonds are allowed for long-term leases and that's a top up every five year fixed term period and modifications if there is a requirement that the tenant has to restore it at the end of the agreement and the cost of restoring is more than $500. One of the big changes is the way that we release bonds at the end of the tenancy. So a renter will have an opportunity to apply for their bond back at the end of the tenancy. 
If we don't dispute it by applying to VCAT within 14 days of their application to return their bond, they automatically will get the money back from the bond authority. So we need to make sure that when a renter claims their bond, we either ignore it and it goes back to them if we're happy for them to have the refund or apply to VCAT, copy the reference number, pop it into the RTBA online, and then that stops that bond. It won't go back to the tenant until a hearing is heard. And if you jump onto the RTBA website, we now get a countdown. So it's like this bond will disappear in 10 days, three hours, five minutes, 10 seconds, and it's got the countdown. So yeah, that's the process that we have to follow for bonds. So modifications, this is an area where um, some people think it's a little unfair. Um, I'm not overly concerned. And when I say that, I'm a landlord too. So I'm a landlord, I'm a property manager, um, I'm a director. So I, I look at this and go, do you know what? Most of it kind of makes sense. A couple of things to consider with this. With the modifications, there's going to, or there is, a list of modifications that a renter can do without your consent. And there's another list of modifications they can do. They have to request consent and the landlord can't unreasonably refuse. If a renter believes consent has been unreasonably refused, they can apply to VCAT to hear the decision and be heard in five days. Now, it's funny when you say hearings will be heard in five days because we personally are waiting for a bond and compensation from March last year. <laughs> I'm sure the team also have hearings that they're waiting from from last year as well as VCAT's trying to catch up with COVID. Um, so as a condition of consent, you might require that the modification be done by a suitably qualified person, for example, licensed electrician. So you can also ask them to pay an additional bond money as long as it's over that 500 and it's equivalent to the cost of reversing the modification. All modifications that the renter does, everything, even if they don't have permission, so the prescribed allowed list has to be brought back to original conditions subject to fair wear and tear at their cost. So all of a sudden I'm like, do you know what? They can do it, but they have to restore it and we can take a additional bond for some items that they want to do as well. So this is a list that is the first one. So these are the things that they can do without your consent. You won't know about it. The agency won't know about it until we conduct our first routine inspection and go, oh, you got your TV on the wall. Oh, you got your picture hooks on the wall. So in all rented premises that are not a registered place, meaning they're not heritage listed properties. Picture hooks or screws for wall mount shelves or brackets on surfaces other than exposed brick or concrete walls. Wall anchoring devices on surfaces other than exposed brick or concrete walls to secure items of furniture. LED light globes, which don't require any light fittings. Water efficient shower head, if the original is retained. Installation of blind or cord anchors. Installation of security lights, alarm system and cameras but not if they're looking in on the neighbour's backyard. They can be easily removed from the property and are not high. So they're more of your portable units. Installation of hardware mounted child safety gates on walls other than exposed brick or concrete walls. Then in all premises, non-permanent window film for insulation, reduced heat transfer or privacy, a wireless doorbell, original, uh, sorry, replacement of curtains if the originals are retained, Adhesive child safety locks on drawers and doors, pressure mounted child safety gates, and a lock on a letterbox. That's it. That is the list they can do at their cost, obviously, um, without telling you, but at the end of the tenancy, they must bring it back to original condition subject to fair wear and tear. These are the items that they can do. They have to ask permission. You can't unreasonably refuse consent. <laughs> If the uh, tenant or renter believes that you've unreasonably refused consent, they can apply to VCAT to get that hearing to get consent within uh, VCAT or hear it in five days. And remembering these are the things you can take that top up bond as long as the cost of restoring is more than $500. Picture hooks or screws for wall mount shelves or brackets on exposed brick or concrete walls. Hardware mounted child safety gates on exposed brick or concrete walls wall anchoring devices on exposed brick or concrete walls to secure items of furniture, draft proofing in homes, but only without open fluid gas heating, including installing weather seals, caulking or gap filling around windows, doors, skirting and floorboards. 
installation by a suitably qualified person of a security system. So this is not a portable unit. This is a proper security system, as long as it doesn't impact on the privacy of neighbours. Installation of fly screens on doors and windows. And I'm actually really surprised that this is a thing that a renter can do at their cost, rather than this going onto a landlord as a cost. Because in the past, if a renter's moved in and said they want fly screens, there have been hearings that have got to VCAT where the members have said the owner has to pay for fly screens to be installed, even though they weren't in the property when the renter moved in. So the fact it's ended up on a renter list is a big win as well. Installation of a vegetable and herb garden, uh, a secure letterbox, painting and for rented premises, and then modifications to secure external gates that are not multi-unit dwellings. Now, I just wanna go back to painting. And this is an area where uh, most owners are a little bit upset. Now with painting, remember they have to ask permission. You can't unreasonably refuse consent. Say they wanna paint two rooms baby blue. You could turn around and go, yeah, absolutely. You can paint them baby blue. But at the end of the tenancy, I require you to paint them back to white. The cost of painting back to white for those two rooms would be $600. Therefore you can do it, you have to restore at the end of the tenancy. If you don't, I will use that additional $600 which you paid me and lodged with the RTVA to organise my painter to go out and do it. We have never been able to do that in the past, to take that additional bond. So I actually think that, although not overly thrilled, <laughs> I also think that the fact that we can take that bond is a good thing. The other thing is that generally renters don't have 10 grand in their bank account. They're not going to want to come in and renovate your house. They're going to want to put up some picture hooks and some TV brackets and secure furniture, make their home feel like a home. Um, but realistically, most of these things don't concern me too much. Maintaining properties. The new RTA has a greater responsibility for the owner to maintain the property in good repair and a suitable state to live in. It absolutely doesn't have to be perfect, but it ha everything in the property has to be in working order. So this requirement's designed to prevent rental providers from not carrying out repairs where the property is an older property and the renter is on that low rent. So for example, let's say you've had a gas heater. Um, the guys went out, Jamie went out, he had a look at it and it's been decommissioned and it's no longer operational. You're not going to fix it. My recommendation is remove it. Now you can, obviously you've got to put in another form of heating, usually gas for gas, um, but your renter might say, oh, I really like a split system. Instead of putting the gas heater in, can you put in a splitty? And you go, yep, no problem, we'll do that. So you leave the gas heater there, you've put in the split system. The next time round, you put in the ad, gas heater not operational won't be fixed in the lease and condition report. That renter moves in fully aware that it's got no intention of being fixed and serves you with a repair notice and you must bring it back to working order. So this was caused by a hearing that went to VCAT back in 2016, Shields versus Valleyopolis. If you want to have a read, that's what it is. Don't ask me to spell it. Um, but it's a really important hearing because the owner won at VCAT, then it got overturned and brought in the rules that we are playing under now, which means that regardless of how old your property is and how low the rent is, everything has to be in working order. So the definition of minimum standards. So the minimum standards apply to rental agreements that started after 29th of March, 2021, or started before 29th of March, 2021, and roll over into periodic agreements on or after 29th of March, 2021. So we have to make sure that our properties comply if they're on a fixed term agreement that starts after 29th of March, um, or if it rolls to a periodic tenancy. So let's say the team signed up your renter last year in October. In October this year, if it was a 12 month lease, the creation of periodic tenancy, or if you sign a tenancy renewal, will then make that property have to comply with those minimum standards. You have to make sure they comply before a renter moves in. If they haven't yet taken possession and they realise your property doesn't comply, they can end their agreement and walk away without moving in. However, they can also move in 
and then request an urgent repair to fix that non-compliance. If you ever took you to VCAT for the minimum standards not being adhered to, VCAT can fine you up to that 60 penalty unit, $10,000. And remember, as part of your disclosure statement, you're ticking the box to say that your property complies. So I'm going to run through them. Locks, they have to have functioning deadlocks. They have to have vermin proof bins, which are council bins for rubbish and recycling. They have to have toilets in good working order. They have to be attached to either a reticulated sewerage system, you know, wastewater treatment system, or a system approved by local council. If you have a septic tank, that's fine as well. Uh, bathroom facilities, reasonable supply of hot and cold water and a three star shower, re uh, shower head rating. Uh, kitchen facility, sink, stove top with at least two burners, food preparation area and any oven has to be in good working order. Laundry facilities, it doesn't have to have them, but if it does have them, it has to have access to hot and cold water. So if you had, say, an older style house and it only had a cold water for the laundry, you would have to get hot water put in. Structurally sound. So you've got to tick off to say it's structurally sound and weatherproof and free from mould and damp caused by or related to the building structure. Electrical safety. Properties will have to comply with standards from 29th of March 2023, and Jamie's going to cover that one for you. Window coverings on all bedrooms and living areas from 29th of March, 2022. And their definition is um, the blinds have to reasonably block light and provide reasonable privacy to a renter. Windows, all must open and close, plus have functioning latches to secure them. There's a bit of chatter around window locks at the moment, and I don't want to give a lot of advice on it because I have a feeling it's going to change. We are still waiting for minimum standards for window locks. Um, in my opinion, it only has to be a latch, which is secured against external entry. But there has been talk that you can only have a latch if a deadlock can't be fitted. And in the original reform, CAV came out and said, we don't want deadlocks. And we're still all saying we don't want deadlocks, but there's chatter on this. So just hold tight um, once the team and everyone knows how it's going to be looked at for those window locks, they will let everyone know if you need to do anything. Lighting, so all properties have to have access uh, to natural borrowed or artificial light to a level of illuminance, which is required for the appropriate use of that room. Uh, ventilation, so properties have to comply with set performance requirements for ventilation as well, and a house has a different standard to an apartment. Heating, again, one that Jamie will cover, but um, energy efficient fixed heater by 29th of March 2023, such as a split system gas space heater, ducted hydronic heater or solid fuel burning heater. It has to have some form of heating from 29th of March 2021 when the property is relet or creation of periodic tenancy after that date. So smoke alarms, pool barrier compliance, smoke alarms, Jamie will cover. Uh, with your pool fence safety, they have to be done every four years. You have to keep records of those um, and provide them to the renter upon request. You also have to put the dates into the condition report, or we do, and into that landlord disclosure statement that you have to sign. And you have to make sure that it's done by a suitably qualified person. Gas and electrical safety checks. Uh, basically, the triggers for this is rental providers that enter into a new agreement on or after 29th of March 2021 will have a fixed term agreement, but only if it's more than five years, which rolls on to periodic after 29th of March 2021, must undertake those gas and electrical safety checks. I'm going to leave that one there. Jamie's going to cover that one as well. But it is in my slideshow. And this um, screenshot or this, this particular slide has been taken directly from the Consumer Affairs website. And the link of that is down the bottom. But Jamie's much better qualified to cover this than I am. Condition reports. So there's going to be different requirements for condition reports at the start and the end of the tenancy. So electronic copies of condition reports will be allowed has to be done whether we take a bond or not. We always take a bond, but we still have to do them even if we don't take a bond. A renter will have five days to complete it instead of previously three. 
within 10 days of a tenancy ending, we must invite the renter to attend the final inspection. So they don't have to come, but we have to prove that we've given them an opportunity to attend. Within 30 days of a tenancy starting, if we disagree with an item on the report, either party can apply to VCAT to get that report amended. And if a renter does uh, notify us about defects or maintenance through the condition report process, it is deemed to be reported and we have to action it within 14 days for a uh, non-urgent repair and immediately for, a non, uh, for an urgent repair. Urgent repairs, some things that will be included are air conditioning, safety devices and fault that makes the property unsafe or insecure, including pest infestations, mould or damp caused by to the building structure. Consumer Affairs Victoria has issued us those guidelines um, with responding to those urgent repairs and it's a really good clear document. Renters can spend now up to two and a half thousand dollars if they have reported those urgent repairs to the agent or owner and they have failed to fix them in a timely manner. If they do organise those repairs to be undertaken, you must reimburse them the cost of repairs within seven days. So non-urgent repairs, renters have two ways to handle this now. So first of all, they can go down the old process, which means they report non-urgent repairs. We have 14 days to action them. If we don't action those within that 14 day period, they can get Consumer Affairs Victoria out to do a report on the property. They then give the report to the renter. The renter then goes to VCAT, applies for a hearing, and there's a hearing about the non-urgent repairs. In the future, the renter does not have to get that report from Consumer Affairs, which means they report the maintenance to us. We have 14 days to get that organised. If we don't get it well underway within that 14 days, preferably fixed within that 14 days, then the renter can go direct to VCAT. So it just means we have to be a lot quicker because if there is a breach of duty notice against the owner and it's the landlord's duty to maintain that property and there is that breach and the renter does take it to VCAT, then the owner can automatically go on what's called a non-compliance register. It will include the landlord name, property address, the agency's name and the agency address. You'll stay on there for three years. It is a bad landlord register. And before you think about it, yes, we do have a bad tenant register. We have two that we can use. <laughs> However, there's rules about how we lodge people. It's not, cert it's not a public free register. So it's not as good as the one that Consumer Affairs has just created, I can tell you. Um, if a renter does cause damage to the property, they do need to fix it or you fix it and then pay you within 14 days. They have got the opportunity to apply to VCAT under hardship if they need an extension. Entry to the premises. So in a perfect world, we get along great with our tenants, the landlords get love the tenants, you know, everyone's happy. Everything just works. It doesn't always work like that though. So if we have a great tenant and we ring them and say, hey, can we come through the property for this reason on this day? And they say, yes, then we can do it. That is by agreement. The other way to get through properties is via notice. Now, if you are going to serve a notice of entry, we can no longer do them in electronic form, meaning we can only do them in person, so hand it to them physically, or via post. Now that is one of the ridiculous changes that has come through, but it's what we've ended up working under. So if we are doing it via post, we have to add extra days on for postage. So seven days notice is a minimum for routine inspection, valuation and advertising photos and videos. It's a minimum 24 hours notice for landlord duty, tenant failed to comply and family violence. It's a minimum 48 hours notice for private or open for inspections for sales and rentals. No longer than one hour per inspection up to twice a week, unless otherwise agreed. For renting, we got a win. We can show them in the last 21 days of tenancy rather than the last 14. For sales, the renter is entitled to the prescribed compensation for each sales inspection. So you're not paying for, uh, you know, building and pest or valuations or, um, you know, any of those sort of things. 
but you will be paying every time the team takes a potential buyer through that property. Now, you're not paying per buyer, you're paying per inspection. Um, it equates to $30 minimum. If your rent's over $420 a week, it will be half a day's rent. Um, and I will email a table to the team if you want to get a copy of it, more than happy for them to share it with you. We, we just created one so that we can work them all out. Uh, when you put the property on the market for sale as well, you do need to serve a renter with a notice of intention to sell, which is a form approved by CAV, giving them 14 days and notice before you are going to start showing the property for inspection. Renters requirements, they must keep and leave the premises reasonably clean. They must not intentionally or negligently cause damage to property or common areas. And if damage occurs, they must tell us. <laughs> they must also, uh, when they report damage or the breakdown of facilities, as soon as practicable after becoming aware, the report will be considered at VCAT if there's a claim for compensation. Um, one more thing to think about with this is the old legislation talked about malicious damage and it was always a really hard one for us to get across the line at VCAT or insurance claims are also tricky. But the way it's written now must not intentionally or negligently cause damage. So it's going to be a lot easier for us to work with in the future. So a couple more things I'm not happy with. Number one, the issuing of what was our no specified reason notice, which was a 120 day notice, that was abolished. And that notice was abolished at the start of COVID and it was never coming back. So we used to be able to say, hey, in 120 days, we want you to move out and we don't have to tell you why, that's gone. So now in order to remove a rent up from a property, we will have to terminate in accordance with these new requirements. The second one I don't like about these notices to vacate is this second paragraph. So if you want to end a fixed term tenancy notice to vacate, you can only do it on the first term only. So what that means is, say you've got a great tenant in the first year, you sign them up for year two. In year two, the rent starts getting a bit late, they're not as clean as what they used to be, and they've been a little bit more difficult with maintenance. And you think, do you know what? I don't really have a legitimate reason. I'm not selling it, moving into it, repairing it, renovating, nothing like that. I just kind of think, you know, they've been there two years, it's time to get them out. You can't. And that's a reality of this legislation because they've restricted the end of fixed term tenancy notice to the initial lease term. Once you go beyond that first year, you can no longer use that notice to vacate. So you can only then rely on, the, on a legitimate reason under residential tenancies, and I'll show you what they are in the next slide. So you also do have to provide documentary evidence with certain notices to vacate. So you might ring the team and say, I want to move into my property. And the team will say, fantastic. Could you please go down to the police station and get me a stat deck? This is the information I require for my stat deck. And this is the information I require for my notice to vacate. When you get that to me, I will serve the notice to vacate on the renter. So the reason they've done that is to stop um, residential rental providers doing fake notices to vacate to get renters out. Renters can give 14 day notice of intention to vacate without paying break lease fees in limited circumstances, including when they need special or personal care. They've been given a notice to vacate. They need temporary crisis accommodation. They've been accepted into social housing or have been given a notice of intention to sell, but they weren't informed of the sale prior to signing the rental agreement. And that's if you have already had a contract of sale prepared or signed an authority with an agent. Death of sole renter has gone from 28 days notice to vacate to upon agreement. These are your termination notice periods that you can rely on in any, the first ones are in any term rental agreement. Immediate notice to vacate, endangering the safety of neighbours, the owner, agent, contractor or employee. It is serious acts of violence. It can't just be the renter calling up us and saying, I don't like you very much. It's got to be the renter coming into the office with a gun. Um, also serious damage to property, including safety equipment. So technically, if a renter breaks their smoke alarms, then it is an urgent 
um, immediate notice to vacate can be served on that renter because they have damaged the smoke alarms, the safety equipment in that property. 14 day notice to vacate is seriously threats, serious threats and intimidation to the owner, agent, contractor, employee. Um, so that's where the tenant has been seriously threatening behaviour or a legal purpose. And that's anything under which is illegal under common law or act. 28 day notice to vacate is pet kept without consent or the renter would like to vacate those premises. 60 day notice bank or mortgage provider who wants vacant possession, end of fixed term tenancy of less than six months, first term only, repairs, renovations, demolition, change of use, business, occupied by landlord, sale of property required for public purpose. 90 day notice to vacate, an end of fixed term tenancy of more than six months, first term only. So they're your options to remove renters once uh, you've made the decision you want them to move on. So this is an interesting one. And I'm gonna give you the example of family member moving in. So February, you've rung the team, they've told you what information they need, you've come back to them with all the information you need, the team have served the notice to vacate on the renter. This is in Feb. Basically what that means is the renter has 60 days plus postage to move out. So let's say they stay for all of Feb, all of March, and they move out early April. You then walk into the office, grab the keys, go to the property and go, oh, change your mind. Don't really want to move in anymore. You come back to the office and you say to the team, please rent out my property again. The team will turn around and say to you, I can't. And the reason for this is you've got to follow through for the purpose of the notice. If you don't, and it goes to VCAT, VCAT can set 150 penalty points at you, which is 25 grand or just under 25 grand. So that used to be 60 penalty units, it's gone up to 150. So you basically cannot rent that property out for six months from the date the notice was given. So if we gave a notice in Feb, you can rent it out again in August, but not before. Or you can apply to VCAT to get the property cleared to be relet earlier. And that is if you have served it for demolition, premises used for business, occupied by landlord or family or sale. Lease breaks and assignment fees. So there is a few changes with these. First of all, if we are assigning a um, agreement from one renter to another, so say we've got two renters in the property, one moves out, another one moves in, um, and we do that change of use or change of lease, generally we will charge a fee to a renter under new legislation, we can no longer charge a fee to a renter, but we can charge it to a rental provider. So you might see a couple of changes on the authority. It means that we will charge you and then get the renter to reimburse you. You can also um, apply for compensation for break lease. So say you have a property that you pay two weeks every time a renter is found. So th this is the example. I don't know what you pay. Say it's two weeks rent. So say the renter's on a 12 month lease and after six months, the renter decides that they're going to move out and break their lease. The renter would have to pay you pro rata let fee. So half of the let fee if they were there for the six month period, advertising based on what you pay to advertise the property and rent until the property is relet or the end of the lease. Utilities, we have to make sure that we are replacing um, appliances in the property with energy efficient appliances or one that has equal or greater prescribed energy efficient rating and we've got different ratings for different appliances now. You must pay for all charges that a renter is not liable for including um, you know, not separately metered charges. So if you have water and it's body corporate and there's no separate water meter for the apartment you would be paying the renter's water. If there's a water leak in the backyard, you would be paying the excessive bill. BCAT uh, will not issue possession without considering whether it's reasonable and proportionate to do so. So, you know, has the action of a renter that's got us to BCAT, is that bad enough to actually put the renter out on the street? Uh, VCAT must also consider depreciation when assessing a rental provider's claim for compensation. So for example, if you have eight year old carpet, it might be immaculate when the renter moves in, but then when they move out, 
it's damaged. You actually will not get a centre's compensation because it has already depreciated its lifespan. It has no value left. Um, and where an application is made to VCAP for breach of duty, um, we can include an owner's corporation if it's required. The rent special account. So let's pretend renter can spend two and a half, well, they can, we're not going to have to pretend, they can spend two and a half grand on urgent repairs. Agents usually will have around about $3,000 on their authority. Some agents charge more, some will say less. My authority does say $3,000 because I want to be authorised for more money than what a renter can spend. So let's say you have a roof leak and it's got to be fixed. It's urgent repair. And you go, I'm not doing it. It's $4,000. Nah, they can just live with it. And I know no one here would ever say that, but let's just pretend. So the renter can't get it fixed because they can only authorise two and a half. We can't get it fixed because we can only authorise 3,000. The renter can apply to VCAT to continue to pay, to pay their rent to the rent special account. So basically they continue to pay their rent in accordance with their lease. And once VCAT collects that $4,000, they will then order for the repairs to be undertaken. Remember too, that if, you, if there is a hearing of VCAT, um, you would go on that non-compliance bad landlord register as well. And that's the one where you are on there for that three year period. So these are some of the guidelines that we've been given under Residential Tenancies Act. And um, they're very, very informative. So your maintenance, cleanliness, damage, fair wear and tear, urgent repairs and endangerment. So the good thing is that VCAT will follow these. So if you have questions about maintenance, we can send you these guidelines and say, this is a landlord responsibility, such as guttering. So cleaning, guttering is a landlord responsibility, not a renter. So there's a whole lot of stuff like that. So it makes it really clear when we ring you go, you've got to do this and this and this, you will actually understand the different guidelines that are required. We've got new Consumer Affairs Victoria forms now as well. Again, it's just allowing that greater sort of consistency and sharing of information. Um, so condition reports, goods left behind, intention to sell, you know, vacating, rent increases, additional bonds, notice to vacate, pet request form, new tenancy agreements, and that statement of information about discrimination. And attached to all of that, or in, uh, with all of that, we also have all of this. So what I've gone through tonight, trying to summarise a thousand pages of legislation plus countless amount of research online um, into one hour. And there's a lot of information and I understand that. So if you get to the end of today and go, I have no idea what Hayley just said about the non-payment of rent guide, um, you can just email the team and they will send you a copy of that and you can read it because I understand a lot of this is very confusing and overwhelming. The good thing is though that the team has done lots of training on this as well. So they are here to keep you informed and safe. So what we have to do now and in the future, number one, really stringent tenancy checks. We have to make sure that the renters we put in the property are good. Uh, we have to make sure that we've got adequate landlords protection insurance. Um, make sure you have it. I think anyone moving forward, particularly with this new legislation that isn't willing to pay that $300 odd dollars for the landlord protection insurance is crazy. Just do it. You know, you've got insurance policies out there that now cover up to $65,000, $70,000 for pet damage. You want to make sure you've got that sort of cover for your property. Make sure you maintain your property, including the safety related checks. A lot of clients uh, thought it was an opt in or opt out. You know, I don't have to do it, do I? You absolutely do have to do it. So you don't have a choice. Just get it done, get it compliant and off we go. Have practices that allow timely dealings with bonds. Remember, if a renter applies for it back, um, it will go within 14 days. So you have to respond to the um, to the, the team quickly um, if they ask you questions about bond releases. I do believe more tenants will be given notice to vacate at the end of a first term agreement, which means a higher turnover of properties and more lettings. It is going to happen because if you don't have a perfect tenant in year one, consider moving them out and starting again so you've got the right one in year two and three. Be prepared to use uh, VCAT more often, have longer wait times for hearings. I absolutely think in the short term, yes, 
But I also think in the long term, no. Because we've got those written guidelines and we're going to have a greater clarity about what is and isn't allowed, we're going to have more ammunition to be able to uh, negotiate better outcomes for our clients without having to go down the stress and expense of VCAP. You do have to prepare, prepare for no, more holding costs to increase. It is going to cost more to hold your properties. However, in return, rents will increase over time. Also appreciate your property manager. This last year has been tough and really tough on the industry. It's been really tough on our renters. It's been really tough on our owners as well. We understand that. But with these changes, it's like we're going back to being the first day sitting in the chair of the office again. You know, we get so ingrained in the legislation, we understand it so well, so that when we get 132 changes come through, we start to second guess every decision we make. So if you're chatting to the team member and you ask them a question and they say, I'm not sure, but I'm going to research and get back to you, there is a reason why they need to do that. So it is a very difficult time for the industry. Be nice. I know you all will. Um, so it has changed. It is what it is. Um, I think in a year's time, we will look back and think it's not that bad. I also think we are going to have better quality properties and from that, rents will increase. So we will, and we'll get a lot of less ad hoc maintenance as well because we're proactively doing our safety checks. We're going to make sure that everything's working. You're not gonna get the odd call out here and there for a broken PowerPoint, for example. So I'm gonna hand back to you guys. Perfect. Thank you so much, Haley. Uh, no it was problem. very, very simplified and snapshot of all these changes. I think we, it was a lot of information, but I'm sure we would have taken a lot of key points which are relevant to you know, us or the landlords who are participating in this session. So thank you so much once again, and we will be in touch with you quite often, and there will be a lot of <laughs> things we need to interact on. <laughs> And hopefully things go for the better for the industry and for us as property managers, um, as professionals, we are recognized better. And hopefully things get simplified from here on. Absolutely. Thank you, Haley. No Hayley, problem. We oh, hang in the back. Of, sorry, Haley. Did you want to do questions now or come? Yeah, we do you? have a couple if you have a quick, quick few minutes before we get Jamie on board. Awesome. So we have what happens if a tenant will not vacate? that can take a long time. Will vacate impose penalty units if an existing tenant refuses to vacate? Um, so there's a process we have to follow with vacating tenants. So it really does depend on the situation. So if we serve a notice to vacate on a renter and they refuse to move out, we do have to go down the VCAP path. Now, if we go down the VCAP path, we are stuck with their decisions. And that's just the reality. And particularly over COVID, where there was a moratorium on evictions, there were a lot of renters that got really behind with their rent as well. And we couldn't do anything about it. And I know some property managers that have had properties where renters have not paid a cent of rent for 12 months, and there was absolutely nothing they could do. So it has been really, really tough. Um, as long as we make sure our documentation is spot on, and we're following the law of every bit of legislation, then we should be absolutely fine. Perfect, awesome. And what constitute as a pet that's not suitable? I guess it's the mystery question. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna make everyone really angry about this. Can you <laughs> tell you what VCAT has deemed as suitable? So cats in a one bedroom flat are suitable, um, dogs in a property if it's suitable. So VCAT has deemed a staffy puppy in a one bedroom flat suitable. They have deemed an Alaska Malamute in an apartment suitable. They have deemed a Kelpie in a townhouse in Port Melbourne with a very small courtyard suitable. Now there has been one which has been deemed unsuitable and I haven't been able to find out what it is. So the one that's actually won, I haven't got the information on yet. So I'm going to put a post on Facebook later. Yeah, we'll keep and ask us posted. <laughs> yeah, I'll let everyone know once I find out. But yeah, basically, they deemed suitable animals that I don't think are suitable. And that's my personal opinion. But it's what we've got to work with at the moment. Perfect. And during the application process for new tenancies, can we ask for rental history? 
Um, yes, we can ask uh, if they've been a renter before, who they've rented from, and we can so say, uh, I have a renter that applies for one of my properties. I can definitely ring the guys at Reliance and say to them, hey, this person's put in an application. Can you tell me about their bond history? Have you ever taken them to VCAT? Those sort of information you can ask of a referee. You just can't have it on their form. Perfect. And I guess, obviously, especially in our area, we have a lot of brand new properties, so all recently refurbished. Would a builder's clean be sufficient for a professional clean? Like, what kind of standard is that? I would hope so, yeah. if you can get written evidence that has been done. So if you can get the builder to do you a dummy invoice, not dummy invoice, but an <laughs> invoice, and it will say, you know, what they've cleaned, because you have to actually list, you can't just say, clean four hours, you actually have to say what was cleaned, then I think yes. But until it's tested at VCAT, it's very hard to know. Yeah, definitely. And mm -hmm. any of these new rules likely to impact current insurance policies from your knowledge? Some of them, yes. Um, so some of the big insurers, and I'm not going to name them, but there was about three years ago, one of my um, clients had a policy with one of the big insurers. And he actually got his renewal and it went up four times. Um, so it went from $300 to $1,200. And he rang them and said, why has it gone up? And, and they said, oh, because of changes to the RTA. And I'm like, they don't even come in for three years. Now, we have noticed that um, an insurance company that we use has recently put up their policy by about $11 a year. So it hasn't been a big increase. The other thing is, if you do go with the specialty insurers, you don't... Um, have increases if you make claims. Whereas if you go with someone like the big insurers, often they will increase your premium if you make claims. Yeah. Awesome. We do have quite a few questions. So what we might do is we'll answer these in an email and send it out to everyone that's attended. So we won't keep you much longer, Hayley, and we'll let yeah, no Jamie jump on. So Sanchez, I'll leave it with you. No worries. Thank you, Stevie. And thank you, Hayley. And... Uh, now we have Jamie, he is from Detector Inspector, whom we have liaised with um, organizing the safety checks in relation to the new legislation changes, which are really, really important and mandatory. Detector Ex Inspector Australia exclusively provides these services. They've been providing this prior to even this legislation kicking in. So they're the best uh, team to provide us the insights of the requirements in relation to these safety checks and compliance. Uh, over to you, Jamie. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, as Sanchi was saying, we have actually been doing these services for quite a few years. Um, it was amazing for us to actually see things like when the regulations were released, pretty much everything in the gas servicing requirements was exactly what we've been doing for five or six years. Um, it almost felt like they were shaping the regulations of what we'd been previously doing. So it was amazing for us to be able to see that. Um, I might just quickly take everyone through um, what's involved in our servicing. Um, I'll share a PowerPoint. And then if we have any questions, we can go through them at the end as well. Bear with me. I'll just adjust my screen a little bit. So... Just a few stats that might surprise you. Um, so one in every three homes that we visit um, for the first time, we find a faulty smoke alarm that needs to be replaced. Um, similarly, 10% of homes we visit have a critical safety issue with their gas, gas or electrical service. That could be a danger to renters. 50% um, on average was how many properties were already using a smoke alarm service prior to the regulations. And 95% of properties didn't have any gas or electrical servicing happening at all. So it's a huge gap to be filling. Um, a lot of agencies, a lot of landlords are already sort of looking at these options, getting on top of it, because they are now a legal requirement. Uh, we've spent a lot of time trying to up our trade base for the last 12 months. Right now, we're still hiring 20 to 30 new gas fitters and electricians every month. So our workforce is just growing massively so that we can meet demand within the industry. Um, as Hayley mentioned, so there's quite a few changes that have come in as of March 29. Uh, the smoke alarms previously recommended, now they've become mandatory at least every 12 months. 
The gas electrical checks previously recommended, now they're mandatory every two years. And there are those additional requirements around swimming pools, bushfire prone areas. Um, ultimately, the onus now falls very much on the landlord to be fulfilling these servicing. It's not enough to sort of be just looking at them and going, oh yeah, I might do it myself. We need to be doing it professionally. So with our smoke alarm servicing, this is something we've been doing 16, 17 years now. Um, it's quite a relatively simple service, but also one that needs to be done within any rental property to ensure the safety of the tenants. Um, so we'll go through the property. We will check all of the smoke alarms. We will test, sorry, test the decibel reading for them to ensure they're loud enough to wake a tenant at night. Um, we'll check for the whether it can recognise the smoke coming into the smoke alarm. Um, we do have fully qualified technicians and electricians as required. We will also assess the location of the smoke alarm as well to make sure it's close enough to any bedroom where generally a fire, if it's occurring at night, we need to be able to wake them with that smoke alarm. Um, any additional smoke alarms we need to install or replace, we will just include it in our servicing as well. And on to the gas safety checks. Uh, so as I mentioned, mandatory checks occurring every two years. Um, the gas safety check does need to be done by a type A servicing accredited gas fitter. That is worth noting because right now, Energy Safe Victoria have advised there's only 1,600 qualified type A servicing accredited gas fitters in all of Victoria. Um, when you have 500,000 rental properties ac across the state, it really does push them to their very breaking point. Uh, so we are looking at constantly growing our staff base. We're building an, a circumstance where we're, every single one of our gas fitters has an apprentice with them as well. So long term, we are building that workforce. Um, yeah, so that's a very big part of it, making sure they might be a qualified gas fitter to install an appliance but they may not have that servicing accreditation to actually be checking the appliance in full. So we will go into the property, we'll check every single gas appliance. Um, that includes gas heaters, gas cooktops, ovens, hot water systems. Um, we've been doing this service around five to six years for the gas appliances. Um, the only thing we needed to change as a result of the regulations is they now require the main gas line to the property to be checked as well. Um, obviously, if there's a leaking gas line at your property, you want that addressed very quickly so that there's no potential danger there. And I think it is something no one thought about in the past, but realistically definitely should have been involved in the service. So we'll go through each appliance, we'll check for dust debris, we'll check the integrity of the heat exchanger, which is quite an important one because you're looking at potential carbon monoxide leaks in a gas appliance, which can result in death. We have seen it in the past, so it's definitely something we want to be watching out for. Um, general functionality of the appliance and just making sure it's working to its full capacity. And a big part of what we do is our record keeping. So being a compliance company, we really want to be all over these kind of record keeping. Um, so all of our technicians, gas fitters, electricians have access to our app. Our app actually runs them through every single step of the servicing. So they have to check all the boxes, take all of the right photos and make sure that there's nothing missed in that servicing at all. It does become very crucial to have these records on file because at any time a tenant can request a copy of the most up-to-date service sheets and that needs to be provided to them within seven days. Um, if the servicing hasn't occurred, obviously, then it puts the property manager in a difficult situation where they're trying to rush to get this done. Um, so very important there. And as I was mentioning, the good news is we have been doing this gas check for the last five or six years, um, very much across what's involved in it. We've very much worked out all of those kinks. So we know what we're doing. Nothing realistically ever surprises us with the gas service. So we know exactly how to be explaining it to everyone and ensuring the best result for you. On to the electrical safety check. Um, so 
bit different to the gas where it's a specific qualification the tradesperson has to have. As long as the tradesperson is a qualified electrician, then they're able to do the electrical safety check. Similar to the gas, it is required every two years at the property. Um, and the yeah, so obviously, again, the renter can request a date of the last safety check and you need to be able to provide them with documentation of that. Um, a little bit different to the gas in that the regulations very much defined what was involved in the gas servicing in the electrical safety check. All it does is refer to the Australia and New Zealand standards, which is a 30 to 40 page document. So we've spent a large chunk of our time working out exactly what is and isn't required to be in these services to ensure we have the right checklist to ensure full compliance. We are also in consultation with master electricians on these new standards that are due to be released in the next year or two. Um, so we'll be at the forefront sort of defining that as well, which is an amazing thing for us to be doing to sort of get that yeah, step ahead and be able to really know what's coming to. Um, in the electrical service, so we'll go through the property and we'll check any points where the tenant would have direct access to electricity. So you're looking at the switchboard, any power points in the property, light switches, um, any appliances supplied by the landlord, then we will check all of the wiring to that property as well. Not a requirement to have those appliances serviced, but we will check the cording to it to ensure there's no potential risk of electrocution. As part of this service, we will replace any power points, light switches on the spot. So whether it be cracked, faulty in the wiring, we'll just replace it on the spot. Um, and on average, we've found we've been replacing around $75 worth of parts as part of that service as well. Um, again, with the electrical checks, we're also following through with our app and just ticking all of the boxes there to ensure we've got the visuals, the documentation that you all need. And we've been doing this servicing since January 2020. Um, it says 15,000 properties serviced there, but since this presentation was created, we would be up to around 25, 30,000. Um, so we're very much learning day to day, but also improving it constantly. Um, I believe we were the first company out there to actually start these electrical checks as well. So that's amazing for us too. Um, just quickly on some related changes. So as Haley mentioned with the heating from March 29, 2021, it is a requirement to have a fixed heater in the living area. As of March 2029, sorry, March 29, 2023, it will be a requirement to have a two-star rating or above fixed heater in place. As we're doing our servicing, we will check in your property and make you aware if there is a one-star rated heater in the property just so then you'll know by 2023, you need to be addressing that. Similarly, with the electrical safety, we'll check the switchboard. Um, by March 29, 2023, all switchboards need to be fitted with an RCD. So we'll make sure that you're aware of that if there are upgrades that are needed by 2023 as well. Um, I might stop it there um, and then essentially we'll be in touch um, through your property managers to educate you more on what's involved in this, how you can sign up with us um, and then any questions you have, obviously we can answer them and go from there. Beautiful. Thanks, Jamie. Um, and it was a bit... This was a lot of technical information in this presentation, I would say. We, we couldn't interpret it um, from our perspective. All we know is that you're there to take care of us. <laughs> That's right, exactly. It's, um, it's always good to know what's involved in it, but also even better to know that someone else is taking care of it all for you. Yeah, so I think with, uh, with your association, we would have the peace of mind as well as the landlords will have the peace of mind that whatever needs to be compliant in relation to this requirement, uh, it's all been taken care of for us. Absolutely. Uh, and I think guys. the big thing is to even beyond the compliance reports, we do have free call outs for all services as well. So if there are issues arising after the service, you're not paying $150 for a call out fee 
just so an electrician can go to the property and say, you've got a dodgy toast to stop plugging it into that PowerPoint. So yeah, that's good to know as well. A huge value save there for everyone. That's great. Um, thank you, Jamie. And Stevie, do we have any Q&As on this? Um, let's have a look. We do have a couple come up. Um, does feeder, oh, sorry. Does fixed <laughs> heater equal ducted heating? Absolutely. So yeah. a fixed heater could be a ducted heater. It could be a space heater. It could be a split system. Um, yeah. yeah. So pretty much anything you can think of, as long as it's not a very basic sort of, you know, off the shelf Kmart heater that might have cost twenty dollars that you can just plug in, yeah, that sort yeah. of thing. Um, yeah, perfect. And obviously, we like we said before, we deal with a lot of brand new properties in new estates. So, what are the gas and electrical safety checks like for new new builds? Yeah, for sure. So, um, as that's something where, to be honest, it's a little bit up in the air because the regulations say that. Uh, safety checks need to be conducted on the gas and electrical. Mm -hmm. um, if the builder has originally done that, then you would be covered for the first two years. Yep. You just need to ensure you've got the full documentation from them that they've provided a full service of the property. Um, so generally in the past, they would just provide documentation of the installation and that it was a brand new appliance, say for the gas. Whereas now they would have to also have a type A gas fitter there to be able to service that new appliance and check that it's fully functional. Um, if that's not the case, the best bet is definitely to still be signing up to a service like this for that peace of mind. Um, the other good thing that a lot of people may not think of in that situation is if there is an issue with that appliance that's been newly installed in your property and we pick up on that issue, it means that you can go back to the manufacturer and say it is faulty and they will cover it under manufacturer's warranty. So there's no cost for you to replace that appliance. So we've had that come up quite a few times, to be honest, as much as you think it's a new appliance, it'll be fine. Sometimes it's not. And it's good to pick it up before it runs out of that warranty too. Perfect. And obviously the fun question, what, what's the cost? <laughs> yes, that's right. I did skip over that a little bit. Um, so we've got a bundle package. Um, so in the first year, you would be paying 678 for all services. Um, that's exclusive of GST. So uh, $754 inclusive of GST. After that, we do just spread the cost across two years to make a consistent annual amount for you. So that amount is $379 plus GST. Um, those prices are based on a situation where you would have uh, more than two gas appliances. If you have one gas appliance, it goes down a little bit. If you have no gas appliances, it goes down significantly because the gas servicing is quite an expense. Um, so we'll communicate all of that through your property managers, the pricing, so you can work out the best package for you. Um, and that'll have more details about the inclusions and yeah, how we can help as well. Perfect, awesome. Um, and yes, so it is valid for two years, your checks. Absolutely. So obviously the smoke alarm checks still need to be done every year as they always have. Um, but the gas and electrical, yes, once you have that done, it would be covered for two years. Um, our package, because we've tried to make it as comprehensive as possible, it has free call outs throughout the period. Obviously, the payments are spread over the two years after the initial year as well. Um, so you are getting those added benefits as well throughout the period. <laughs> um, perfect. And I guess, you know, not every landlord knows how many gas appliances in their property when they're signing up for detector inspector. So how does detector inspector help with that? For sure. So it's very dependent on the property. I find that most properties, if they have gas, they will have at least two appliances. Um, the only exceptions we've really found is apartment buildings where they might just have a cooktop. Um, there's also potential that you could be discussing that with your property manager. If they've done a routine inspection, they may know what appliances are at the property. Um, we will also, if you say aren't sure at all about it, if you sign up to the single option and we attend and find that there's more than one appliance, we will service those additional appliances and then just bump it up to the higher option because we want to ensure the compliance of your property as well. 
So just for clarity, a cooktop, hot water and heating, there's three separate gas counters. Absolutely, three separate gas yep. Um, even things like if you had, say, a barbecue that was connected to the main gas line in the backyard, then that would be included in the servicing as well. Yeah, um, yeah so pretty much anything connected to gas is deemed as a gas appliance. Mm -hmm. And is it the same fee per property, even if you're a multi-landlord? Is there any discounts for multiple, prop like any multi-investor? Yeah, so it, when signing up to our bundle, you do get a 10% discount automatically applied. Um, on top of that, if you have four or more gas, sorry, four or more properties, you're getting an additional 5% as well, which will be reflected on your invoice. Yeah, perfect. Awesome. I think that's all the questions. You're off the hot seat now, Jamie. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much. And also thank you so much to Hayley. It's a lot to take in, lots of changes. Um, but as we said, we'll continue to spread awareness whenever we come to know with all these changes to all our clients as well. So anything else you'd like to add, Santi? No, that's, I think it was an informative session for the timing because it's just been a couple of weeks till this legislation's kicked in. And as Hayley said, we're just figuring out how the tribunals are interpreting this legislation and what sort of precedents will be laid down in your future. And I think in a couple of months time, we should be able to advise our landlords and tenants more concretely as to the outcomes of what in certain situations in relation to the tenancies and, and issues which come along. Awesome. Thank you. Well, a big virtual round of applause for Jamie and Haley, <laughs> And thank you for everyone who's joined us tonight. We will send out the recording and any questions that weren't answered, we will send those answers as well. So thank you so much and enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.